I warned well, our well, people. Well, 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 well. This joint assembly is convened. This joint assembly is convened pursuant to the provisions of JRS 3, which the clerk will now read. JRS 3, joint resolution to provide for a joint assembly to hear the inaugural message of the governor. Resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the two houses meet in joint assembly on Thursday, January 10, 2019, one o'clock and 30 minutes in the afternoon to receive the inaugural message of the governor. Please rise and remain standing while Mexico's Consul General, Graciela Gomez Garcia, and Honorary Consul Dr. Jessica Holmes are escorted into the chamber by Staff Sergeant Bear Lukomansky, Aerospace Medical Technician, Squadron Medical Element, 134th Fighter Squadron, 158th Fighter Wing in South Burlington, Vermont. Please remain standing while Quebec delegate to Boston, Marie-Claude Francois, is escorted into the chamber by First Sergeant Chris Sample, currently serving as First Sergeant of the 86th Troop Command, located in Williston, Vermont. Please remain standing while Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, Douglas Hu, is escorted into the chamber by Sergeant First Class Jesse Blomgren, currently serving as Combat Engineer Readiness NCO and Alpha Company, 572nd BEB 86th IBCT in Bradford, Vermont. Please remain standing while former Governor and Mrs. James H. Douglas are escorted into the chamber by Master Sergeant Jean-Luc Perrault, Senior Administrative NCO for the 124th Regiment in Colchester, Vermont. Please remain standing while Governor Peter E. Shumlin and Katie Hunt are escorted into the chamber by Sergeant First Class Deborah Brown, HR NCO with the 124th RTI out of Colchester, Vermont. Please remain standing while the Honorable Justices of the Vermont Supreme Court are escorted into the chamber by the Sergeant at Arms. Please remain standing while Treasurer-elect Elizabeth A. Beth Pierce is escorted into the chamber by Staff Sergeant Megan Byrne, Financial Management and Analyst, 
Knowledge Operations Management Specialist and Recruiting and Retention Advisor in South Burlington, Vermont. Please remain standing while Secretary of State-elect James C. Condos is escorted into the chamber by Sergeant Jessica Smith, Human Resource NCO with the Army Mountain Warfare School, part of the 124th Regional Training Institute, Colchester, Vermont. Please remain standing while Auditor of Accounts elect Douglas R. Hoffer and Suzanne Gorman are escorted into the chamber by Master Sergeant Mac Broyich, Infantry Battalion Operations Sergeant Major in Jericho, Vermont. Please remain standing while Attorney General-elect Thomas J. Donovan and Jessica McLeod are escorted into the chamber by Staff Sergeant Yulia Benson, Supply Sergeant for the 40th Army Band in Colchester. Please remain standing while Marion Dubois, Diane Mateague Scott, Erica and Rachel Scott, and Kevin and Donna Scott are escorted into the chamber by Major General Stephen Cray, the Adjutant General, State of Vermont. Chair, would like to recognize the Senator from Chittenden District for the purpose of making a motion. He never served in this chamber. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I move that a committee of six be appointed by the chair to wait upon His Excellency Philip B. Scott, the governor-elect, to escort him into the chamber for the purpose of receiving his inaugural message. The senator from Chittenden District has moved that a committee of six be appointed by the chair to wait upon His Excellency Philip B. Scott, the governor-elect, and escort him into the chamber for the purpose of receiving his inaugural message. Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is carried. The chair appoints as members of this committee, Representative Noyes, the member from Wolcott, Representative Haas, the member from Rochester, Representative Beck, the member from St. Johnsbury, the senator from Windsor, Windsor <clears throat> Wyndham District, Senator Ballant, the senator from Grand Isle District, Senator Mazza, the Senator from Caledonia District, Senator Benning. Will the committee please assemble and perform the duties assigned to it? The joint assembly may be at ease. President. 
Madam Sergeant Arms. May I present to you the Honorable Governor of the State of the Vermont, Philip B. Scott. Please remain standing while the State Police Honor Guard posts the colors. Please remain standing while Rep. Kevin Coach Christie sings our national anthem. <clears throat> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in the air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say dust, that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. May be seated. We will, we will now we will now hear from the Edmonds Middle School seventh grade chorus who will now sing America Beautiful. The invocation will be given by the Most Reverend Father, Leopold J. Billadu of the Carmelite Nuns of Lowell, Vermont.
governor asked me to have a little humor in the in the air, but I couldn't think of any way of doing that. But well, we have Senator Dick Mazza, who's got a great voice. I thought we could sing the following song all together. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to make it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, source of all life, freedom, and authority, I come before you in solemn prayer on this inauguration day of Philip E. Scott, the 82nd governor of the state of Vermont, and David Suckerman as the lieutenant governor. We thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon our state, from its shores, to its mountains, to its farms, towns, and cities. We ask that you continue to watch over this free state, its citizens and its leaders, now and for many years to come. In a special way, we ask you to pour forth your blessings upon Governor Scott and Lieutenant Governor Suckerman, as well as their wives and their families, as they begin anew their special service to the state of Vermont. Bless them with wisdom courage and love as they take the prescribed oath and accepts the heavy responsibilities of our state's highest office. Keep always faithful, keep them always faithful to their solemn pledge and enable them in your love to bear true allegiance to the state of Vermont and its constitution by seeking the common good of all Vermont citizens and by joining hands with all our fellow citizens in the ongoing work of building a state that seeks to be a place of freedom, justice, and compassion for those most in need, especially for the poor, the marginalized, and the unemployed, a state that cherishes and uses wisely the resources with which you have endowed our land. May Vermont, founded as a beacon of religious liberty and toleration, continue to uphold this most cherished freedom by welcoming in the public square faith and the values that flow from faith. Show us the path, Lord, to be builders of relationships in our state and its communities so that we may bring forth harmony from our diversity Bless our governor as he seeks to create cooperation among government, business, service, and faith communities, so that together we may create opportunities for all our fellow citizens, especially our young people, to fulfill their God-given potential in loving homes and families and safe and effective schools. Lead us, Lord, in finding ways to build trust in communities to curb violence, and to protect the homeless, the destitute, the infirm, and the elderly. Give our governor, our legislators, and all those in government service an ever greater measure of understanding as they address the difficult problems that are facing us all. Most of all, Lord, give us joy and give us hope that we may be preserved in unity and freedom and in that peace the world cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, be admitted to those who are eternal. We make this prayer in thy holy name. Amen. Chief Justice of the Vermont Supreme Court, the Honorable Paul L. Ryber, and Diana Mateague Scott will now come to the podium. The Chief Justice will now administer 
the oath of office to the governor-elect. I solemnly swear that I will. or indirectly and that I will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution injurious to the government thereof or government so help me God so help me God I do solemnly swear I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of governor the office of governor for the state of Vermont for the state of Vermont and will therein do equal right and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons and justice to all persons to the best of my judgment to the best of my judgment and ability and ability according to law according to law so help me god so help me god i do solemnly swear i do solemnly swear that i will support the constitution that i will support the constitution of the state of vermont of the state of vermont and the constitution united states so The oath of office to the constitutional officers will now be administered by Governor Philip B. Scott. First, the oath will be administered to Elizabeth A. Beth Pierce. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Elizabeth A. Beth Pierce. I, Elizabeth A. Pierce. Solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. And that I will not directly or indirectly. And that I will not directly or indirectly. Do any act or thing. Do any act or thing. Injurious to the Constitution. Injurious to the Constitution. Or government thereof. Or the government thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of treasurer. That I will faithfully execute the office of treasurer for the state of Vermont. For the state of Vermont. And will therein do equal right and justice. And will therein do equal right and justice to all men and women. To all men and women. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. According to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the State of Vermont. That I will support the Constitution of the State of Vermont. And the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. The oath will now be administered to James C. Condos. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, James C. Condos. I, James C. Condos. Solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. And that I will not directly or indirectly. That I will not directly or indirectly. Do any in, any act or thing. And do any act or thing. Injurious to the Constitution. Injurious to the Constitution. Or government thereof. Or government thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of Secretary of State. 
that I will faithfully execute the office of Secretary of State for the state of Vermont. For the state of Vermont. And will therein do equal right and justice. And will therein do equal right and justice to all men and women. To all men and women. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. According to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. I will support the Constitution of the State of Vermont. I will support the Constitution of the State of Vermont. And the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. The oath will next be administered to Douglas R. Hoffer. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Douglas R. Hoffer, solemnly I, swear. Excuse me. I, Douglas R. Hoffer, solemnly so affirm. Swear. Yes. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. And that I will not directly or indirectly. And that I will not indirectly or directly. Do any thing, act or thing injurious to the Constitution. Do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution. Or government thereof. Or government thereof. Under the pains and penalties of perjury. Under the pains and penalties of perjury. I solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm. That I will faithfully execute the officer of auditor of accounts. That I will faithfully execute the office of the auditor of Vermont. For the state of Vermont. For the state of Vermont. And will therein do equal right and justice and will therein do equal right and justice to all men and women to all men and women to the best of my judgment and ability to the best of my judgment and ability according to law according to law under the pains and penalties of perjury under the pains and penalties of perjury i solemnly affirm i solemnly affirm that i will support the constitution of the state of vermont that i will support the constitution of the state of vermont and the constitution of the united states and the constitution of the united states under the pains and penalties of perjury under the pains and penalties of perjury congratulations thank you The oath will be administered to Thomas J. Donovan. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Thomas J. Donovan, solemnly swear. I, Thomas J. Donovan, solemnly swear. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. And that I will not directly or indirectly. And I will not directly or indirectly. Do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution. To any act or thing injurious to the Constitution. Or government thereof. Or government thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of Attorney General. That I will faithfully execute the office of Attorney General. For the state of Vermont. For the state of Vermont. And will therein do equal right and justice. And therein do equal right and justice. To all men and women. To all men and women. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. According to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the State of Vermont. I will support the Constitution of the State of Vermont. And the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. A second invocation will now be given by Rabbi, Rabbi Toby Weissman of the Yearning for Learning Center for Jewish Studies, Montpelier.
according to Jewish tradition. Each day of the week has a new light, never before experienced, a divine energy of renewal and rejuvenation. We have the ability to connect with this unique light as we begin this legislative session with the inauguration of Governor Phil Scott for his second term. What can we learn together that will help our governor and the people of Vermont begin this term with the highest intentions and best actions? In this week's Torah portion, Moses tells the people, in the future, you shall tell your children, with a mighty hand, God brought us forth from Egypt, from the house of slavery. Moses told the people then, and is telling each of us now, in every single generation, that we have a responsibility to vividly remember, recall, retell, reenact, and relive our story of being enslaved and becoming a free people. We have the duty to take a deeper look into our lives and ask ourselves, where are we enslaved? And affirm that we have the power to choose to become free people every day. The Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, meaning a narrow place, a place of being stuck. And according to Jewish tradition, in order to be freed from slavery in Egypt, each day we need to actively disconnect from the stuck places in our lives. We all must take responsibility to become people who are connected to doing acts of love, justice, and compassion. Every day, we are given the strength to personally and collectively free ourselves from whatever limits us from being our best. We are the people of this brave little state of Vermont, and we are part of a nation. We can choose to free ourselves from Egypt, from Mitzrayim, from the narrow stuck places where we find ourselves. We all have the power to choose to build a society that honors the freedom of all people, not just our own. We all must consciously acknowledge that dignity, honor, love, and compassion are divine gifts of the Creator given to each human being. All of us are created in the image of the Creator of the universe. Those of us who have the power need to ensure that these freedoms are given to each person. Governor Scott, the people of Vermont have reaffirmed our belief in your ability to lead this great state. We have all witnessed how you have steered us to build a state focused on justice, dignity, love, and compassion for your fellow Vermonters. Today we stand with you as you are about to continue on your journey as governor of Vermont. We hope that you will set a strong example to approach any challenges with the utmost courage. We are all looking to you for your guidance, your inspiration, and encouragement to discover ways to help our neighbors and communities. Governor Scott, may you be blessed to lead the people of Vermont so that we will all be proud to tell our children how under your leadership, 
We chose to build a society that honors the dignity of all of us. The Edmonds Middle School seventh grade chorus will now sing These Green Mountains. It is now my distinct honor to present to you the governor of the state of Vermont, the Honorable Philip B. Scott. Chamber will please come to order. <laughs> I like Bill Lee as well, just for the record. And how about how about those Red Sox, huh? Yeah.
Mr. President, Madam Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the General Assembly, distinguished guests, and fellow Vermonters, I want to begin by thanking the people of Vermont for the opportunity to serve as governor and for their trust and support as we carry out the work ahead. It is the greatest honor of my life. I also want to thank my wife, Diana, my two daughters, Erica and Rachel, my mom, and my entire family for their support and love. I couldn't do this without you. This is the second time I've had the privilege of addressing you as we open the biennial session. Each time we've gone about our work against the backdrop of a national political environment that's brought out the worst in the public process. Unfortunately, this still exists today, as too many value political points over policy solutions. Social media still overflows with negativity and hate, and politics as a whole still seems to divide us more than it brings us together. I truly believe that in Vermont, we can set a standard others across the nation can aspire to, and elected officials can look to as a better way, the right way, to go about the work of the people. And when the work gets difficult, when tensions build, which they will, when divisions seem too deep to overcome, when we need to be reminded that there's still good in the world, look no further than the people of Vermont. We We saw the good in the people of Swanton, who sheltered and fed their neighbors as floodwaters forced them from their homes in the depths of winter. The good lives in the young girls and boys who were inspired when they saw a Montpelier native, Amanda Pelkey, take the ice halfway around the world in South Korea. When she was born, hockey was a game for boys. 25 years later, we welcomed Amanda home an Olympic gold medalist. The good is in the pride hundreds of us felt on a cold day in November to celebrate the return of Ceres, the goddess of agriculture, and the incredible work of two Vermont artists, Jerry Williams and Chris Miller, whose craftsmanship will stand for generations on top of this beautiful building. The good is in Sarah Byers, the owner of Leonardo's Pizza in Burlington, giving those in recovery the opportunity to get back to work, knowing full well the road may be rough, but believing in the person and the journey and seeing past the stigma of addiction. The good is found in the Perry family, whose combined 120 years of dedication and service in the Navy was recognized at a shipyard in Groton, Connecticut, as the USS Vermont was christened. Four sons, three grandsons, and a daughter-in-law, all following in the footsteps of the former representative from Richford, Captain Al Perry. We saw the good in two political opponents running for the House in Lamoille County, Lucy Rogers and Zach Mayo, a Democrat and Republican debating the issues then sitting together to play a musical duet, proving to the nation there is a better way. Every day, we see the good in our service men and women, in our first responders, our teachers and nurses, in our coaches, scout leaders, mentors, and all those who serve others without expectation of praise and often too little recognition. The good is in this chamber. It's here because it lives in each and every one of our communities, the places we come from and the people we go home to. It's in our schools and churches, our businesses and farms, our forest trails and town halls. The good, the courage to show a better path is the same courage that allowed those who came before us to persevere through harsh winters, to carve our way of life from granite mountains and rocky hillside pastures. The good is in our hearts, it's in our minds, 
and it's who we've always been. Today, more than ever, it's who America needs us to be. And to meet the challenges ahead to best serve Vermonters, it's who we have to be. Our focus must remain on those we're working for and what we're working towards. To do that, we must face the economic realities that exist across the state in all 251 towns, cities, and villages and the impact our policies have on each of them. We must look for common ground. Instead of highlighting or exploiting our differences, view consensus and compromise not as a weakness, but as a strength. And if we can, our work, our actions, our results will inspire a renewed faith in government and give hope to every community. Together, we can work toward a more prosperous future for our state and our people, where families in every town are moving up the economic ladder with a good paying job and a way of life they can afford, where all kids get a quality education with the same opportunity to achieve their full potential, and where we do all we can to provide for our neighbors who need us most when they need us most. An affordable Vermont with opportunity and economic growth, with great schools in every corner of the state, and policies that benefit all Vermonters. This can be our legacy. We can achieve this vision, but it requires us to recognize and overcome the obstacles in our way. I know some may be tired of hearing me talk about our demographics or have given up and believe there's nothing we can do to change them, while others may not feel a sense of urgency because their own community hasn't been impacted as dramatically as others. But you don't have to take my word for it. Just ask Moody's who recently downgraded our bond rating in part due to our lack of population growth, resulting in fewer working age Vermonters. These facts and this problem can no longer be ignored. Just take our labor force as an example. Since 2009, our labor force has declined by about 15,000. 15,000 fewer people working or looking for work 15,000 fewer Vermonters available for jobs we know businesses are trying to fill right now. 15,000 fewer potential income taxpayers. <clears throat> These losses have been felt across the state, but have had the greatest impact outside of Chittenden County. Since their peak employment, Washington and Franklin counties have seen a labor force decline of about 2%. By the same measure, Addison and Orange have seen a reduction of nearly 5%, and Grand Isle and Orleans have lost around 6 Bennington, Lamoille, and Wyndham have seen their labor force shrink by 10%. In Windsor, 12, Caledonia, 13, Rutland, 14, and in Essex, it's down by almost 20%. This demographic reality is perhaps most apparent in our schools. It's like the canary in the mine shaft. In our public schools, we're now educating about 30,000 fewer K through 12 students than we were in 1997. That's an average loss of three students a day for over 20 years, and that trend continues. There's not a single county that hasn't been affected. Since 2004, which wasn't all that long ago, Franklin County's enrollment has shrunk by three and a half percent and is doing the best by far. Chittenden, Lamoille, and Orange counties have seen declines of 12%. Enrollment has dropped by over 16 in Caledonia County, 17% in Orleans, and nearly 19 in Washington. In Bennington and Grand Isle, it's declined by 21%. In Wyndham, 23. Three counties, Addison, Rutland, and Windsor, have lost a quarter of their students in 14 years. And in Essex, 
they're educating 42% fewer kids. These declines are eroding quality and opportunity for our children, and this is happening on our watch. These trends not only mean fewer in our workforce and schools, but fewer customers of businesses, ratepayers for utilities, fewer available for our volunteer fire departments, and others who support the needs of our communities, and fewer to share the costs of state government with ongoing needs in areas like transportation, building maintenance, public safety, and human services. But there are other needs as well. We have a moral obligation to protect our seniors and kids and treat those impacted by mental illness or addiction. We're committed to restoring and protecting our lakes and rivers, which will cost Vermonters nearly $1 billion over the next 20 years. And we must keep the promises we made to our state employees and teachers to pay their pensions and health care costs in full. The debt we owe today is over $4 billion. And the annual payment to catch up continues to grow by tens of millions each year. But let's be clear, a deal's a deal. Each of these commitments are important. But our stagnant population is threatening every service we deliver, every program we administer, and every investment we hope to make. Even the most optimistic among us must recognize what this means. Without a different approach, our major change in circumstances, our current revenues won't support our obligations, our wants, or even our needs. On the campaign trail, <clears throat> a Burlington business owner told me, we don't need more taxes, we need more taxpayers. The solution is really that simple, but the path to a better outcome requires our best ideas, our best work, and the courage to make real change. That's what we signed up for and what's expected of each of us. Vermonters elected me and many of you to ensure we don't ask them to shoulder any more of the tax burden. They're doing their part, and it's time for us to do ours. Despite these challenges, we have so much to offer and so much to be hopeful for. We're one of the safest, healthiest states in the country. We have a good education system, which I believe we can make the very best. And we have a culture and lifestyle that is second to none. These things offer a great quality of life, which is among the best recruitment tools we could ask for. This is all positive but we know it's not enough. So this session, let's focus on strengthening those assets to keep and attract more working families with an eye on reversing our population trends. Let's grow the economy to support jobs and organic growth, expand our tax base, and ease the burden on hardworking Vermonters. Because if we want people to move here and stay, we must make it more affordable. This is how we rise above the challenges ahead of us, improve the lives of Vermonters, and chart a new course for our future. First, let's work to reinforce the things that make Vermont such a great place to live, the health of our citizens and environment, and the strength and safety of our communities. Vermont has one of the lowest uninsured rates in the nation. We rank among the top states for the health of our women and children, the number of mental health providers, and physical activity. We're also among the best in the country with low instances of violent crime, obesity, and infant mortality. Many of you in this room, as well as our predecessors, have contributed to this success. But Vermonters still struggle with a high cost of insurance, especially those in our state marketplace. That's why I'll propose health insurance reforms focused on increasing affordability for Vermonters, and specifically young people, as we work to retain and attract more of them. And during the campaign, I talked about a voluntary paid family leave plan, 
balancing the value of this benefit with Vermonters' ability to pay, in the coming weeks, I'll roll out that concept. I truly believe that an opt-in approach puts us on a path to the goal that we all share without raising a new tax. We can also build on our work to protect our environment, communities, and kids. We rank high when it comes to air quality, but we can do more to lower emissions in our state, so I'll propose using settlement funds to help more Vermonters purchase electric vehicles and my budget will propose a long-term funding source for our water quality initiatives using existing revenues and a new delivery model to put this money to work on the ground. This fall, we learned from the Department of Health that some students may be exposed to lead in drinking water in our schools. Here's an area we agree on. So let's act quickly to protect our kids. In order to do that, my budget will invest in lead testing at schools statewide. And if you'll work with me in budget adjustment, we'll have every school tested within a year. <laughs> Second, we'll continue to transform our education system, going from good to the very best in the country, supporting and educating every child from cradle to career. Many of us here today have heard countless debates about education, but far too often it's been about something other than the kids themselves. From taxpayers to teachers, the fate of buildings and debt, old districts and new districts, and rates and rebates. This has created a fear of change that's handcuffed us to the status quo and distracted from the single most important purpose of our schools, educating our kids. We must have the courage to make the conversation about giving every child the best possible chance at a good future. And the truth is, not all of them are getting equal opportunities. Here's just one example of what students are facing. Now I want to be clear, these are real middle schools in Vermont, but I'm going to call them School A and School B. Students at each are taught language arts, math, science, and social studies. But School A has advanced math, like Algebra 1. School B does not. School A has 20 sections of art. School B has one. School A offers multiple French classes. School B doesn't have any foreign languages. School A has band, chorus, music, health education, industrial arts, and family and consumer sciences. School B doesn't offer a single one of these. You might be surprised to hear that these aren't schools from opposite ends of the state. These two middle schools feed into the very same high school. This is not an isolated case. It's happening across Vermont. So we must continue to address the inequality that exists. I've heard you. And believe me, I recognize a change of this magnitude takes time. But in the near term, I believe the best opportunity for progress is in early care and learning, to give all kids, regardless of their background, a strong foundation. We've taken important steps. Let's build on it this year by working together to give every child an equal chance at success. Last fall, I identified a new revenue source to put toward these initiatives, which I'll detail in my budget address. If we can work together on a high quality child care system that's affordable and accessible, along with a stronger education system, we could set Vermont apart from other states as an education destination for families. We can, and will debate on policy, and that's okay. But let's focus on the merits of our ideas. Let's not resort to scare tactics. Let's roll up our sleeves and make change that make, gives all our kids an equal shot at success, that puts their interests above special interests and builds them, hands down, the best cradle to career education system in the country.
Next, we must ensure businesses can stay competitive with those in other states around our region because we can put all the best ideas on the table to attract young people and support working families. But if we don't have jobs, none of it will matter. Act 250 was created nearly 50 years ago to address a rapidly growing state. At that time, there wasn't the regulatory oversight to deal with the population expansion brought on by the baby boom and the interstate highway system. But those circumstances no longer exist. That's why I'll propose reforms to modernize Act 250 in a way that expands growth in our struggling downtowns while continuing to protect the environment. Because we can and must do both. This proposal... <laughs> this proposal builds on the work we did together last term to modernize regulation and support the development of affordable housing in our downtowns and growth centers. This year, we can do even more to build stronger communities by updating Act 250 and encourage more compact development while preserving our working lands and rural character. We also know that broadband is crucial to parts of the state that are currently underserved or in some cases, not connected at all. I'm sure most realize this isn't the cure-all to our economic challenges. But as we seek to attract more people to live and work in Vermont, we must continue to expand access. This session, I'll put forward a package of reforms, and my budget will include investments to do just that. As I travel the state, I see places struggling to survive, many a shadow of what they used to be. We've reached a point where too many are not growing. They're shrinking. Whether you're here from Reedsboro, or Alberg, Island Pond, Richford, Springfield, Newport, or any one of the proud communities that helped write Vermont's economic history, but now face tough times, know this. I'm eager to work with each of you to develop policies to revitalize all 14 counties and to ensure that hope and opportunity exists, not only in Burlington, but in Brattleboro, Bennington, Berkshire, Barton, and all 251 towns across our state. Finally, we need to do a better job leveraging our assets, the things that make Vermont a great place to visit, work, and live. Consider this. In 2017, the top towns for millennial home buyers were not New York City, Boston, or San Francisco. They were Williston, North Dakota, Athens, Ohio, and Aberdeen, South Dakota. Millennials appear willing to put affordability and quality of life over the conveniences and attractions of our biggest cities when buying a home. I believe Vermont can offer what they're looking for, and in many instances, we already do. The work we did last term in the areas of housing, education, downtown development, and workforce training, while striving to make Vermont more affordable, were positive steps forward. But we must do more. We know availability of affordable housing is a huge barrier to recruiting young workers. I hear it every day from employees and employers. Last term, we, we worked together to create more housing Vermonters can afford. Let's build on that progress by focusing on existing stock and rental units. My budget will propose a package focused on growing the housing supply by revitalizing properties and investing in existing neighborhoods. These are steps in the right direction, but it's not enough to simply offer things that appeal to young people and working families. We have to do a better job telling our story and use it to aggressively recruit new Vermonters. Even if you believe Vermont is perfect, 
It's clear we aren't doing enough to persuade people to move and stay here. Last year, thanks to the innovative thinking from the legislature, we launched a program offering incentives to remote workers who moved here. Just passing the law gained international media attention. And as a result, nearly 3,000 people inquired about the program. This showed us a couple of things. First, publicity works. <laughs> and second, people do have an interest in moving here, but sometimes just need a reason to take that first step. That's why my budget will again propose a labor force expansion package that targets those likely to move in a regional sales team approach to close the deal. I hope you'll join me in supporting this effort because investing to grow our workforce is one of the most, one of the single most important things we can do for our economy and to reduce the tax burden on those here now. This fall, I visited employees at Eden Ciders in West Charleston. My team heard that they'd, uh, they'd had success recruiting young workers to relocate here, and we wanted to learn more. I asked them why they chose Vermont. Most said they liked the sense of community we offer. Many also thought it was a good place to raise a family, while some came for outdoor recreation. While there, someone shared that Precision Composites in Lindenville wasn't having any trouble filling positions, even engineers. Now, that got my attention, because just the week before, I was at Collins Aerospace in Virgins, and they said they were looking to hire 25 engineers, but were struggling to do so. What was the secret in the Northeast Kingdom? They put a help wanted ad in a mountain biking magazine. <laughs> the point is, we know people want to come here. We just need to identify and reach those who do. Collectively, we have a lot of good ideas. So let's act on them together. Let's build the best education system in the country and nurture a business climate that keeps and creates good jobs so we can better compete with other states. Let's think creatively about attracting more workers and families so we have the revenue to better serve the Vermonters already here. Let's support policies and make investments that will work towards these goals and do so without digging further into the pockets of Vermonters. Because to build the future we want for our kids and their kids, we must ensure Vermont's affordable. While our challenges are great, when we work together, we can do great things. Over the last two years, our record speaks for itself. To improve efficiency and better serve Vermonters, we merged the departments of liquor and lottery, a long-standing goal for some legislators in this room. And we did the same in creating the Agency of Digital Services, which has saved taxpayers about four million since its creation. With your leadership, we supported foster parents and crime victims, strengthened consumer protections, and are working to make prescription drugs more affordable. We modernize our licensing laws to expand the pool of drug treatment professionals and make it easier for members of the military to enter the civilian workforce. When actions in Washington put access to health care in jeopardy, Speaker Johnson, Senator Ash, Republican Party leaders from both houses and I stood with Senators Leahy and Sanders and Congressman Welch to protect Medicaid funding. Where else but Vermont would you see such a politically diverse group joining together to defend access to health care? And for two years, we didn't raise a single tax or fee in the general fund. We also held statewide residential property tax rates level while fully funding school budgets. We removed the tax on Social Security for low and middle income Vermonters and worked to revitalize downtowns and villages throughout the state. We made the single largest investment in housing the state has ever seen. 
as well as a 70% increase in clean water funding, and opened a treatment center in St. Albans that helped eliminate long wait lists statewide, allowing more Vermonters to start on a path to recovery. We did all this and so much more by working together. It wasn't always easy or comfortable, but hard work, good work, is rarely either of these things. And we need more of it because the solutions we seek in the political environment in which history has placed us requires that, above all else, we focus on what it means to be true public servants. When announcing his retirement in 2005, Senator Jim Jeffords said, in no other job do you have both the freedom and the obligation to solve problems and help people on a daily basis. Solve problems and help people. A simple concept and an important reminder of why we're here. As partisanship and division have eroded the trust many have in our democracy, as conflict captures headlines far more often than the good work we've done to strengthen Vermont, and as reports of our disagreements overshadow all we agree on and the progress we've made working together, let's solve problems and help people. That's our job. It's our responsibility. It's what our neighbors who elected us expect. It's what the challenges we're here to confront demand of us. And most importantly, it's what Vermonters deserve. As we open this new biennium with the hope and promise of a new year, let's commit to this work, put aside our differences, to work together, to come together, to solve problems and help people each and every day. Thank you very much. The benediction will be given by the Reverend Dr. Robert A. Potter, Senior Minister, Peacham Congregational Church. say that I miss the choir in the balcony. <laughs> and when I saw Phil Handel dissent today, aren't you glad that we live in America when you think? I've got a prepared text. I usually speak extemporaneously, but I want to just add this, Phil. I have a son who is a pastor in St. Johnsbury, Dr. Jeffrey Potter, who told me the other day after being offered a big church somewhere else, I will never leave Vermont because I love this place. <laughs> And I have a grandson, I'll brag just a second, and I have a grandson who went to Champlain, then to Norwich, kind of runs the sys computer systems administration stuff at St. J Academy. 
He said, I wouldn't leave Vermont for anything in all the world after having been offered a job almost a quarter of a million dollars in Washington. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> this is my fourth visit over the years to this inaugural podium. I have uh, never been invited to thunder, what do you call it? Thunder Oak. Thunder Oak. Thunder Oak. <laughs> I thank you for this honor, even though my friends at the town dump say government is beyond prayer and hope. I'm sure they meant Washington and not Mount Pelier. <laughs> but when I pressed the point, I got a very articulate moan and groan. <laughs> it's a new year, a new term, a new goddess. A new old symbol, same old Vermont values, same hard work. So we have gathered here today, sent by folks who, like you, want nothing but what is best for this land we love. This land where the hills give us hope, the valleys our vision, and our values, and the mountains, our meaning. We come at a time when the national debt is seemingly as insurmountable as a camel's back. Even the river runs mad in the valley. And the monsters from a very good lake would devour us anew and a man's field may be a lonely place. But we are wise to note that the waters of Willoughby are deep and still. So should we be. Given the day, 10 days away, I want to reflect once again with you on my long friendship with Dr. King. Martin Luther King spoke the day long ago at Yale and ended with these words. The moral arc of history is bent toward justice. From my long-kept notes in memory, I gave this benediction that day. We must not leave this hallowed hall without the hope that is born from that arc of history. Nothing must be allowed to steal our hope, our gratitude, our joy in today's celebration. Nothing. No terrorism, no tyranny, no tragedy, no trouble. Today, tomorrow, or ever. To this point, two years ago, today, after the inauguration, our new governor stood with his family just outside before the flag at half-mast in memory of his dad who died to this life when Phil was only 11 years old the same age as when my mother died. We both know, as do all and each of you, how precious 
is the past as we focus our life on the greater good. And so as a boy in Barry, he knew that the stuff of earth under his feet was as solid as the values and the rocks for the ages from whence he came. So with your father, in the mystery of forever love, and your mother, Mary, and your family who love you, we remind you that you are loved, Governor. You are respected with continued great expectations. <laughs> Got to add this. To a weary world and a divided nation, the words of the Vermont motto above us, freedom and unity, tell us to find our way anew. God almighty, wasn't that a great address from the governor? <laughs> Vermonters have long known what to do in the wilderness. In the pulpit in Peachum, I've had this sign for years. We may not have it all together, but together we have it all. <laughs> we know, let me say before we leave, we know it can be lonely at the top. Alone is OK. The ride home from Mount Pelier can be lonely, in spite of the lovely landscape that in a dark winter's night we may not see but know is there. May we also know in the mystery of our best moments, honoring the different ways we see things, that sometimes, somehow, somewhere, somebody loves us. And therein, may we find the courage to carry on. Governor Scott, dearly beloved, let us find that courage and carry on. Reverend Potter. Share your pain. <laughs> and Governor, I share the uh, the love that you feel from your dad. You lead us well.
Will the joint assembly please rise and remain standing? Will the committee please reassemble and escort the governor from the chamber? And remain standing because it shouldn't be long before they come back. Welcome back. <laughs> Please remain standing. Will the Sergeant at Arms Please escort the Honorable Justices of the Vermont Supreme Court from the chamber. Please remain standing. Will the National Guard please escort our distinguished guests from the well of the house?
You may be seated. There being no further business, I do hereby declare this joint assembly dissolved. <laughs> 